Thank you. So I've come across your research a number of times in my career, struck by its uh, its originality and and its impact. I, I'd like to ask you first about something I, I probably ran into, maybe it's 20 years ago, maybe it's 15, something like that. You did some work on the perception of attractiveness, bilateral symmetry, averageness, and sexual selection. Can you outline what you found and why? Yes. Um, I did work um, some years ago now in uh, uh, human uh, attractiveness, and um, that turned out to to be very uh, productive about attractiveness in general in animals. And one of the key uh, traits that animals look at in judging uh, physical attractiveness of, of partners, of mates, is uh, bilateral symmetry. And uh, a colleague and I in the early 90s uh, came up with a way to measure uh, facial symmetry in humans. It had been uh, worked on before, and but the measurements that they used were uh, didn't work. Uh, so we came up with a, with a method that did work, measuring bilateral symmetry in the face. So that is the symmetry of the two sides of the face. Why is that important and why is it a marker for attractiveness? It turns out that, that bilateral symmetry is a measure of developmental health. And so the, the organism, uh, when it starts developing, it's designed by evolution, by selection, to, to uh, achieve a bilaterally symmetric form. You can think of that, it, this is the case when I say organisms, I mean all forward-moving organisms. All forward-moving organisms uh, have, uh, have, have adaptations, developmental adaptations to achieve a bilaterally symmetric body because, first of all, that reduces drag. So if you're moving forward and you're bilaterally symmetric, you don't have any drag in your movement. You can think about a person with a, a leg uh, a bit shorter than the other, and there's drag in the move in the forward movement. The more of that asymmetry, the more drag. So you lose efficiency in movement. That's fundamental to what bilateral symmetry is about. But next, bilateral symmetry is very hard. Perfect bilateral symmetry is very very hard to achieve by development. So it's a marker of quality of the individual pertaining to its developmental health. We see in many things that human beings design to move forward bilateral symmetry. Cars or automobiles are bilaterally symmetrical. Airplanes are bilaterally symmetrical. Yeah. So We like our world to be that way. Yeah, we like our world to be that way, actually, it turns out. And, and, um, well, and you're associating car, it with the, the market. Principle. If, you had, if you had one side of the car uh, asymmetric compared to the other side of the car, then there'd be more drag. You know, it's not an efficient, you'd, you'd use more gas. Think about it that way uh, in driving down the road with an asymmetric car. Um, but so this, this is one component of physical attractiveness, bilateral symmetry. And we looked first, when we developed this uh, way to measure <clears throat> facial symmetry, uh, that became a, a, a very hot research topic. We did the first, and then others followed very quickly. And lots and lots of research has been done now. But there's, you know, symmetry of movement that's important in, in how fluid one's movement is and how attractive, therefore, one's movement is. You're not dragging your foot or whatever. And um, all that is really a, a component of the importance of health in physical attractiveness. So physical attractiveness fundamentally is a health certification. That's how we judge uh, people's attractiveness. We don't think about it consciously. It's an unconscious calculation of the traits important in uh, health. And developmental health as bilateral symmetry is one of these. So you measure the symmetry of the two sides of the face, and we showed in our first study of this way back now that uh, that measurement uh, relates to how attractive faces are perceived, Try faces of the same sex or opposite sex. And then that research went on to look at uh, kids looking at faces and 
uh, et- different ethnic groups looking at faces. It works like a charm wherever you do it. And lots and lots of research. And so does it mean that if you show people symmetrical or asymmetrical faces that they obviously have a preference for the symmetrical faces. Will they look longer at the symmetrical faces? Will infants look longer at symmetrical faces? Yes, they do. Yeah, that's the way the infant infant beauty research is done. You just look at whether the whether the baby and they got it down now to almost newborns, you know, looking at faces and um, judging these faces, basically, on the basis of interests, how long they look at the face versus getting distracted to something else. And symmetry is one compart- part of the uh, beauty, whether you're talking about babies or kids or old people or young people or whatever. Facial symmetry is, is very important. It's not the only beauty marker in the face we look at. We can talk about that in a moment, too, because that gets us into uh, some other research we've done. But symmetry is a very important one. Now, that research went on to look at how symmetry plays out in the everyday lives of people. And we did uh, the initial studies on that. But again, that that research bloomed and uh, lots of people are, uh, have done it. And still, it's an active part of uh, research. But the first thing we did, not just attractiveness, we did a bunch of that in relation to symmetry. But we looked at uh, sex lives of uh, people, romantically paired people. Uh, studies of uh, couples and um, looked at uh, looked at uh, re- uh, reports by men and women of sex partner number that they've had in their lifetime. Uh, that was one component of it because that's that's a that's a measure in men in particular of uh, what biologists call mating success. So number of number of uh, sexual partners one has, and uh, that. That research showed that for men, uh, the more symmetric the man, uh, the more sex partners he had. And a technical detail there, after we, we you know, initially started with facial symmetry, but then we moved to the body of people. We came up with a metric for body symmetry, measuring 11 traits on both sides of the body. These traits are um, ear length and ear width. Um, and, and then we measure elbow. There's some elbow anatomy there that we measure, some bones, wrists, fingers, all those men measure, of course, on both sides, measure foot width, ankle width, trace like that. And then we put that together in a composite as a measure of body bilateral symmetry. That correlates highly with facial symmetry because the s- symmetry is a developmental health measure throughout the body. And um, that correlates with uh, mating success of men. A more, more symmetric men are physically more attractive and they have more sex partners. Uh, we also got into um, looking at men's infidelities in their relationships and found that more symmetric men uh, engage in more uh, matings outside the pair bond as well. So that's, that's part of their mating success. We did uh, the first study of um, a kind of modern study, we would call it, of uh, female orgasm uh, in in, uh, uh, copulatory orgasm. Uh, So in part, looking at women, uh, 200 romantically paired couples and asking the women about their orgasm patterns during mating with their partner and separately asking the men. And we found that the men's reports and the women's reports of frequency of copulatory orgasm by the women were very highly correlated. So men are paying attention to this phenomenon of whether the female is sexually aroused to the zenith level of orgasm, of course. And uh, more symmetric men were firing uh, more copulatory orgasms too. That was a very classic study. And, so I have a specific question about that. Yeah. that I've always wanted to ask a biologist interested in sexual behavior, but I know that there's been a lot of discussion about the hypothetical evolutionary purpose of female orgasm. And I was wondering if female orgasm is disproportionately likely to trigger, trigger male orgasm. I, because it could be, it could be an yeah. adaptation that's used to elicit pregnancy, essentially. Yeah, I don't think it is. It's there's no there's there's no evidence 
that females that orgasm very infrequently have fewer babies. And actually women who don't ever orgasm can be quite fertile. So I don't think it's fundamentally that. I think what it is, is it's part of female mate choice and more, and more basically sire choice of the female. Let me explain. So when a female uh, has an orgasm, uh, she has uterine contraction, of course. And that pull, it works like a suction. It pulls the uh, content of the vagina up to the cervix. So it puts the, puts the content of the vagina in a good place. And if that content includes the male's ejaculate, then she's pulling the male's ejaculate up to the cervix where it's easier for him to get, you know, easier for the ejaculate to get into the right place to conceive. So if she, imagine a female who has two mating partners. She orgasms with one, pulling his ejaculate up to the cervix, and she skips orgasm with the other partner. So she, in effect, is mated with both men. So that is, you know, same mating success of the two men, if you just look at mating success. But she's doing something more subtle that is differentially affecting the fertilizing capacity of the ejaculate of the two men. The, man, the ejaculate she pulls up has more potential for fertilization. And that's a component of cryptic female choice. So uh, in the 80s, I discovered uh, what I labeled as cryptic female choice, first in insects, and then uh, it, it applied to f- uh, female uh, orgasm uh, too in, in, uh, in humans. As a, in cryptic female choices is just the the kind of female choice that is invisible if you're only m- measuring mating success. So in the example we talked about, the two guys mating with this female had the same mating success. They both mated with her, but one had was was preferred over the other by the female's orgasmic capacity with him that pulled his ejaculate up. And so females, by showing this differential uh, um, orgasm pattern that I described with symmetry, are favoring symmetric partners over other men. Men, are you looking for freedom? Are there things in your life that are holding you back from being the man that you're called to be? If you're looking to build a life plan that is ordered towards prayer and discipline alongside other like-minded men, then you need to check out Exodus 90 app. The Exodus 90 app offers a daily companion to help you grow closer to God and to become the man you want to be, the man you need to be. On the app, you can join thousands of men for St. Michael's Lent, which starts August 15th and leads up to the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel on September 29th. St. Michael's Lent is an ancient tradition of prayer and fasting popularized by St. Francis in the Middle Ages that's been lost in our time. Let's bring it back. Join the men of Exodus 90 and Father Carlos Martins, Catholic priest and host of The Exorcist Files, who will serve as our spiritual guide for St. Michael's Lent this year on the Exodus 90 app. We will awaken to invisible realities and enter into the spiritual battle that rages around us all the time. Go to exodus90.com jbp for a 14-day free trial of the Exodus 90 app and to learn more about St. Michael's Lent. That's exodus90.com jbp to join us for St. Michael's Lent starting August 15th. And hypothetically healthier partners and, and I mean, hypothetically yeah, providing your kids with, part, an, right. with an advantage. Higher, that's right. Higher genetic quality. And then that's that's an issue behind all this discussion so far is that uh, female organisms uh, are after uh, high genetic quality partners when they're, when they're, you know, to be fathers of their offspring. So it's a sire choice. More the a cryptic female choice is more of a sire choice than just a mate choice. And Darwinian, Dar, Darwin, Charles Darwin discovered uh, female choice and did a lot with it for sure. And biologists had viewed um, female choice in a Darwinian framework up until very recently, until cryptic female choice came along. But females are far more sophisticated than just choosing one male over another as a mate. They do, they do these subtle things and involved in cryptic choice to prefer some uh, the uh, sperm of some mates over the sperm of others. 
whole suite of now that's, that's a big area. Of, well, what uh, other elements are what other elements make up cryptic choice? You you described well, orgasm. In, what else? Uh, what else? My disco flies? first discovery was was in uh, some insects called scorpion flies, and what the females do there is they adjust mating duration. And hence the amount of ejaculate that the male transfers. There's no orgasm in these insects, but the longer the male can mate, the long, the bigger his the the more sperm he transfers to the female. So females are adjusting ejaculate duration on the basis of body size of the male. So and by bigger males are more fit males and so forth, better growth and uh, more resources growing up. They're higher quality males. The females are receiving more sperm from bigger males. That's one thing I did with these insects. Another was the female, after she mates with a male, makes a choice of whether to lay eggs or not. If she chooses to lay eggs, then she will fertilize, we you know from other research I've done, she will fertilize those eggs with the last male sperm she mated with. So if she makes the decision to lay eggs, she's going to use that last male sperm. She, and, and large males, again, um, are preferred in that component of cryptic female choice. So cryptically, these female scorpion flies are preferring large-bodied males by both uh, receiving more sperm from them and making decisions to lay eggs uh, with them and not other males. So those kind of subtle things that... Uh, females do that aren't apparent if you're just measuring classical males mating success, you know, 